Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. This is our part 11 of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. And friends, this is our last part for our AZ900 question and answer series. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for giving me so much of love and giving such attention to this series. And congratulations to all who have passed AZ900 with great marks and best of luck to all who want to attempt in future. As promised, besides these 11 parts, I will also bring a bonus part where I will answer all of your questions on AZ900. So use the comment section below and send me all your questions or doubts. And don't miss to give me a like and press that subscribe button. More and more exam series are already planned and you don't want to miss any of those. Friends, this series has been quite happening and in total, we have covered 150 questions spread across 11 parts. Each question is supported by proper explanation and documentation proof from Microsoft. The entire series will surely help you to get high scores in the AZ900 certification. And not only that, you will also be geared up to work in Azure by the time you get your certification. So don't miss any of the 11 part before you appear for the examination. The link for the entire playlist is given below in the description box and also appearing in the i button on the top right corner. So let's begin our part 11 with question number 141. The question says that which tool enables users to authenticate to multiple application by single sign on or also known as SSO. Your options are Azure Resource Group, Azure Active Directory, Azure Advisor or Azure Monitor. The correct answer for this question is Azure Active Directory. Now let's check out the Microsoft documentation to understand why this is the correct answer. Now here I am on the Microsoft documentation which talks more about Azure Active Directory. The documentation says that Azure Active Directory Enterprise Entity Service provides single sign-on, multi-factor authentication and conditional access to guard against 99.9% .9 of cyber security attacks. I'm sure you have already noted the keyword here which is single sign-on. And with that proof from Microsoft documentation, we can be sure that our answer is correct. Before I jump into the question number 142, I want to give you some more details on Azure Resource Group, Azure Advisor and Azure Monitor. These topics are very important from the exam point of view. So you should have at least some basic understanding on all of these. You can expect quite some questions from all these three areas as well. So let's first understand Azure Resource Group. Azure Resource Group is a container that holds related resources for an Azure solution. The resource group can also include resources for your entire organizational solution. But I would say the better way is to group related resources and manage them as a group inside a single resource group. For example, you can combine all the resources related to HR group or HR department in one resource group and all the resources related to finance department in another resource group. Not only the resource group is the better way to handle related resources together, but I would say it is also a better way to delete the resources together. So for example, if you have some related resources to the finance department and you want to delete them, and all of those resources are present in one single resource group, then you don't have to delete them one by one. You just select the resource group and delete them all in one shot. Now, from the exam point of view, here are two more important points related to resource group that you must keep in mind because I have seen questions coming based on these two points. The first one is that all the resources in Azure must reside under a resource group. What it means is that you cannot have a resource that does not reside under any resource group. So whenever there is a resource, it has to be under a resource group. Moving on with the second statement, we have one Azure resource can only be inside one resource group. You can move resources from one resource group to another, but the resource cannot be in two resource group at the same time. 
there might be some questions in AZ 900 exam where they would ask you can a resource be present in multiple resource group at the same time and then you know the answer that it is not possible. Now let's briefly understand what is an Azure Advisor. So this is the page where you can read more about Azure Advisor. I would read the first part of it. The Azure Advisor analyzes your configuration and usage telemetry and offers personalized actionable recommendation to help you optimize your Azure resources for reliability, security, operational excellence, performance, and cost. So come on to this page and take a deep dive on Azure Advisor because there are few questions based on Azure Advisor in AZ-900 examination. Moving on, let's understand what is a Azure Monitor. So Azure Monitor, it helps you maximize the availability and performance of your application and services. It delivers a comprehensive solution for collecting, analyzing, and acting on telemetry from your on-premise and cloud environment. I have given a greater detail on Azure Monitor in question number 131 in part 10. You can refer that part for more details on Azure Monitor. With that, now let's move to the question number 142. This question is about Azure Sentinel and it says that Azure Sentinel use playbook to monitor the Azure services, maintain security certificate, run PowerShell scripts or automatically respond to threat. Before directly jumping to the answer, let me tell you more about Azure Sentinel because this is one of the lesser known Azure service. And there can be no better way to learn than Microsoft Azure document itself. So this is the page that talks more about Microsoft Sentinel and one important point that you should keep in mind that Azure Sentinel is now called Microsoft Sentinel. So in case you have gotten a question with Microsoft Sentinel or you get a question on Azure Sentinel, you should be sure that they are both talking about same thing. So let's understand what a Microsoft Sentinel is. So Microsoft Sentinel is a scalable cloud native security information and event management and security orchestration, automation and response solution. And here, if you scroll a little down, you can see there are steps that are given in context to the Microsoft Sentinel. And this picture helps you understand all these steps in a better way. So Microsoft Sentinel starts with collecting security data across your enterprise. So once it has collected the data, then it moves towards the detection of threats. Once the detection is also done, then it tries to investigate what are the threats with its critical incidents guided by AI technology. And once the investigation is done, then it moves towards the response. So it responds to the threats automatically. And while I'm reading this, I also note that Microsoft has still not changed. It still calls it Azure Sentinel while on the page above that Azure Sentinel is now called Microsoft Sentinel. So keep in mind that Microsoft Sentinel is something that can collect data around security. It can detect your threats then it investigates the threat and then it respond to the threats. Besides this page, there is one more interesting page on Microsoft Sentinel and this is this one, which gives you more details on using the playbook with automation rules in Microsoft Sentinel. Now coming back to the PPT, I hope you can already answer the question. The correct answer for this question is automatically respond to the threats. And that's the exact purpose of Azure Sentinel. In fact, should I also say it now, Microsoft Sentinel. Now let's move to the question number 143. This question is about Azure Total Cost Ownership. It says that who can use Azure Total Cost of Ownership TCO Calculator. So let's start by understanding what is a Azure Total Cost Ownership Calculator. So this is a calculator that helps you estimate the cost of operating your solution on Azure over time instead of running that solution on premise. So let's say the company wants to move the application from on premise data center to cloud. Now the very first question that comes to everyone is how much it costs to run the same application on cloud. Is there any way that you can already make an estimate before you even move to the cloud and here exactly where Azure total cost of ownership comes into picture. So it enables you to estimate the cost of moving your entire solution from on-premise data center to Azure Cloud. 
This is the page where you can read more about Azure total cost of ownership calculator. It's a great page that gives you a lot of insights about how Azure uh, total cost of ownership calculator works. And here, if you press this button here, it says start assessment. If you click on this, then you can see it loads all the details, all the nitty gritties that probably might be used in your current data center solution. And you can see it gives you some sections which are servers. So you could be using servers in your existing solution or data center. You could have database, you could have storage, networking. So each component that possibly might be already in your data center solution is present here. Now, if you expand each section, then here you can try to estimate what would be the cost of servers being moved from data center to Azure Cloud. Similarly, you can estimate the cost of database, storage and networking as well. So I hope you understood that Azure Total Cost of Ownership Calculator is primarily used by the people who are still to move to Azure Cloud. They are already not present in Azure Cloud. They want to go there. So the correct answer for this question is anyone. Now let's jump to the question number 144. The question says that you have an on-premises application that sends email notifications automatically based on a rule. You plan to migrate the application to Azure. You need to recommend a serverless computing solution for the application. What should you include in the recommendation? Your options are web app, server image in Azure Marketplace, Logic App or an API app? Correct answer for this question is Logic App. Just to give you a clue why I choose Logic App, the, the reason is whenever there is keywords like serverless computing in your question, then two services you should always keep in mind. First one is Logic App and the second one is Azure Function. So always try to relate serverless computing with these two Azure services. To all my existing viewers and those who are new today here, just want to tell you that besides these videos, I always share the PDF version of the PPT that I use in my videos. This will give you a chance to learn both in online mode and offline mode. To get the PDF version of the PPT that I have used in part 11, you have to tell me the answer that I gave for question number 143 and question number 146. And if you want the PDF version of any older part, then do watch the videos and give the answers to the questions asked in respective videos. Now let's jump to the question number 145. The question says that you plan to deploy a website to Azure. The website will be accessed by users worldwide and will host large video files. You need to recommend which Azure feature must be used to provide best video playback experience. What should you recommend? Should you recommend an application gateway or an Azure Express route circuit, a CDN network, or should you recommend Azure Traffic Manager? Now here on this page from Microsoft, more details on CDN network are given. So a content delivery network or better known as CDN is a distributed network of servers that can efficiently deliver web contents to users. CDNs store cached content on edge servers in point to presence POP location that are close to end users to minimize latency. So have you noticed the keywords here? The keywords here are can efficiently deliver web content to the users. And that's exactly what our question wants us to do. So it wants us to provide the best video playback experience. Thus, the correct answer for this question is Option number C, a content delivery network or CDN. Now let's talk about all the other services so that you are not left behind if the questions are coming from these areas. So the Azure Application Gateway is a web traffic load balancer that enables you to manage traffic to your web application. On the other hand, Azure Express Route Circuit represents a logical connection between your on-premises infrastructure and Microsoft Cloud Service through a connectivity provider. You can order multiple express route circuits. Moving on with the Azure Traffic Manager, it's a DNS based traffic load balancer. So this service allows you to distribute traffic to your public facing application 
across the globe in Azure region. Traffic Manager also provides you with public endpoints with high availability and quick responsiveness. So I hope you got a gist of other services as well in this question. Now let's move to our question number 146. Now this question talks about SLA or service level agreement. So let's read out. It says that you have an application that is comprised of an Azure web app that has a service level agreement of 99.95% and an Azure SQL database that has an SLA of 99.99. .99. The composite SLA of the application is the product of both SLAs which equals to 99.94%. Now let's read the instructions. The instruction says that review the underlying text. So this is the underlying text here. You can see if it makes statement correct, then select no change needed. If the statement is incorrect, then you have to select the answer amongst these options given below. So let me just briefly tell you more about composite SLA. So guys, whenever you are designing a Azure solution, you must be using different services. For example, you might be using Azure virtual machines, database, or maybe a web app. And every service in Azure has a associated SLA attached with it. But how will you calculate a composite SLA? Which means that you have different services Every service has a different SLA, but what about the composite SLA of the solution in total? How to calculate that? And let me just give you a small demonstration on our calculator so that you can understand how these composite SLAs are calculated. So now let's multiply both of these numbers. We have 99.95 and then we have 99. 0.99 and this gives us 9994.0005. Now, as I said, you have to divide it by 100 and this gives you 99.94. Now, do not get confused with this comma because I am in part of Europe where decimal is also represented as comma. So, you can read it as 99.94. So I hope this small demonstration made you understand the calculation of composite SLA in an easier way. However, those who want to deep dive can come to this page and read more. If you will scroll down a little, they have also given an example on how to calculate the composite SLA. So here you can see the same example is given here, a web app service that has 99.95 and a SQL database 99.99% .99 of SLA. And now what they're essentially doing is, is a multiplication of both the SLA to reach the final composite SLA. And as always friends, all the links that I'm using in this video will be given in the description box below. Now coming to the PPT, the correct answer is no change needed because as we calculated the composite SLA for both the services will come to the 99.94%. Now let's jump to the question number 147 and it's a yes no kind of question. Now let's deal with the first statement. The first statement says that the cost of Azure resource can vary between regions. The correct answer for this statement is yes. See, it's very important for you to understand that in Azure, you can deploy resources in various regions. Now to give you an example, let's say that you have deployed a virtual machine in East US and the other one have you deployed in Japan, let's say for example. Now do you think the cost of both the virtual machines given the fact that all other configurations are same will be equal? The answer is no, because the cost of resources in different regions can differ significantly. So for example, the difference between East US 2 and Japan East region is about 58% for specific virtual machine sizes. Now keep in mind guys, the figures or the percentage that I'm giving, they can definitely change. So to get the correct picture of that, always refer to the Microsoft documentation. However, the idea I wanted to give you is that the cost of same service can vary from location to location. Moving on with the second statement, this says that an Azure reservation is used to reserve server capacity at a specific data center. The correct answer for this is no. 
To justify why I have chosen a no here, let's read the statement once again. The statement says that an Azure reservation is used to reserve server capacity at specific data center level. So it's important that you are noting that the question or the statement is asking whether reservation can be done on a specific data center level or not. And what could be the better way to understand this than doing it in practical on Azure portal itself. So let's go to the Azure portal. So here I am on the Azure reservation page and from here you can purchase reservation for quite a different kind of Azure services. You can see we have virtual machines, SQL servers, we also have managed decks and a lot of other services that you can make reservation for. So let me choose one of the services. Let's go for the first one which is virtual machine. If I click on this one, now you can see that select the product you want to purchase. If you come a little down here and you see this section here, it gives you some heading. For example, name, name is the kind of virtual machine that you want to make reservation for. Then you have region, then you have instance flexibility group and a lot of other information. Now I hope that you remember that the statement was asking that the Azure reservation can be done on data center level. But if you see the headings here, you can see that the scope of the reservation is not on the data center level, but the scope is on region level. So you cannot make reservation of any Azure service on data center level. So always keep that small tip in mind. So I hope that small hands on on Azure portal has helped you understand why I have chosen a no for this statement. Let me tell you more about Azure reservation. So Azure reservation helps you save money by committing a one year or three year plan for multiple products. Now committing always help you to get a discount on the resources that you are using. So reservation can significantly reduce your resource cost by up to 72% from pay as you go prices. So, so reservations provide a billing discount and do not affect the runtime state of your resource. After you purchase a reservation, the discount automatically applies to the matching resource. I hope you got a fair idea about what Azure reservation is used for. Now coming to the third statement, this one says that you can stop an Azure SQL database instance to decrease the cost. Now we have talked a lot about Azure SQL database throughout this 11 parts and there have been many questions around Azure SQL database. But once again, I just want to tell you that Azure database is a fully managed platform as a service. Always keep that in mind, platform as a service. And it's a database engine that handles most of the database management function such as upgrading, patching, uh, backups and monitoring without user involvement. Now SQL database does not provide access to the underlying SQL server and hence it does not allow you to stop Azure SQL database. And that's why the correct answer for this statement is no. Before moving ahead, I just wanted to say that friends, if you're liking my efforts that goes in finding proper Microsoft documentation to justify each answer and giving you explanation for each question, then do encourage me by liking the videos and subscribing to the channel. Your each like will ensure that the videos are reaching to the greater audience. Your comments and feedbacks are very valuable for me and I make sure to read each one of them and answer them as well. Keep supporting me and I shall bring the very best of the content. Now let's move on to question number 148. This is a drag and drop kind of question and here on the left hand side you are given with some of the Azure services and you have to match these services to the definitions given on right hand side. Now let's read the first definition. It says provides the platform for serverless code. Now you have to choose which of these services will match with this definition. So the correct answer for this one is Azure Functions. Now I have mentioned this a couple of times that guys whenever you are seeing the word serverless code then two Azure services should always strike your mind. The first one is of course Azure Function and the second one is Azure Logic App. Moving on with the second statement, we have a big data analysis service for machine learning. 
The correct answer for this statement is Azure Databricks. Then in the third statement, we have detects and diagnose anomalies in web apps. The correct answer for this one is Azure Application Insights. And then the last one says host web apps. And the correct answer for this one is Azure App Service. Now keep in mind, it could be host web apps or it could also be host mobile apps. In both the cases, the correct answer should be Azure App Service. Moving on with question number 149. This one is again a drag and drop kind of question. And of course, in this one also, we have to match the Azure services with the definitions given on the right hand side. So let's read the first definition. It says that ability to use the same credentials to access multiple resources and application. And I'm sure you guessed the correct answer and that is single sign on. So single sign on gives you the ability where you can log in to multiple applications or resources using same credentials. And I'm sure many of you who are already working with some organization have already experienced this. Then moving on with the second statement, we have the process of identifying the access level of a user or service. The correct answer to this one is authorization. Now friends, I have seen many people getting confused between authorization and authentication. So let me give you a very brief difference between both of these. So starting with authentication. Now let's suppose you have a web application. Now, whenever you're logging to web application, what you normally do is you provide your user ID and password, and then you try to log in. Now, when you press the login button, what happens is the internal logic checks whether you are authenticated to log into the application or not. So you can say that authentication is a check whether you are a legitimate person or not. On the other hand, authorization is one step later. So let's say now that you have logged in to the application or the website, that means you are authenticated. Now authorization will decide what can you do on the website. So what is the level of access that you have on the website or any other application? For example, you could have only read only access or you are an administrator. Everything is decided by the authorization process. So I hope this quick differentiation between authentication and authorization will really help you answering the questions in AZ-900 certification. Now let's move to the third statement and it says that one or several elements required to identify a user or a service. The correct answer for this one is multi-factor authentication. And friends, multi-factor authentication is not a difficult thing to understand. And I'm sure all of you, or at least most of you are already using multi-factor authentication. For example, whenever you're logging to your bank accounts, then what happens? The first level, at the first level, you give your user ID and password. And post that, normally bank sends you a text message or a code on your mobile number or any other application could be used like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator and many more. So what is this? So you are authenticating a user on multi-level. That's the crux of multi-factor authentication. So not just ID and password, you are enforcing the user to use one more level of authentication so that you can validate the person. That's exactly what multi-factor authentication means. And that brings us to the question number 150, the last question of part 11, as well as the entire series on AZ-900 real exam question and answer series. So now let's read out the question. The question says that you need to view a list of planned maintenance events that can affect the availability of an Azure subscription. Which blade should you use from Azure portal? To answer, select the appropriate blade in the answer area. So friends, first let me show you this in the PPT and then I will take you to the Azure portal to demonstrate in practical. So now let's check out the step-by-step -step process on how to do it. The first step is that on the help and support blade, there is a service help option. Let me show you how. So this is the image of Azure portal. And on the left hand side, normally on the Azure portal, you can see all these options. And here on the bottom of the page, you can see an option called help and support. When you click on this help and support, a new window opens that is called help and support and here on this window you can see the option which is called service health 
and when you click on the service health a new window opens and there you can find an option called planned maintenance and this exactly what our question is asking they want us to view a list of planned maintenance events that can affect the availability of an Azure subscription. Now let me take you to the Azure portal and show you how this is done in practical. Now here I am on the home page of Azure portal and on the left hand side you can see down below we have an option called help and support. If you click on this option then you get this window and here on this window you have to click the option which is called service help. When you click this option then in turn you get a new window in which you can see the option which is called as planned maintenance. So whenever there is a planned maintenance in any of the service in the regions that you are using then that planned maintenance will be reflected out here. However, as of now, you can see that there is no planned events schedule. Thus, it's empty here. But normally, if there is, then you will see all of them here. So I hope with that demonstration on the Azure Web Portal, you now know how to see the planned maintenance events that affect availability of your Azure subscription. So friends, once again, a big thanks for being with me throughout this series. If you have been benefited with this series, then do appreciate me by pressing that like button. And don't forget many more exciting exam question and answer series are coming in next few days. So do not forget to subscribe. Till we meet each other in the next video, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching.